And then the green light, I don't know if that keeps flashing. Yeah, no, that should do it. Turn it off now. Okay, uh, you ready to get started? Okay, so. Good morning and uh, welcome. Welcome back. Um, as always, we have uh, commercial messages before we start the show. Good morning. You're not late. So, um, today and next Wednesday, we'll be talking about some of the non canonical gospels. But starting in September, we will be talking about the prophet Isaiah. So that'll be September the 4th, 11th, and 18th. Okay? Um, so there's a there's a little sheet up there if you need a reminder. We'll have it in the bulletin. We'll have it on the app. We'll uh, have a sky writer. You know, <laughs> <laughs> we really want people to show up for that. Um, second thing, I'm not going to go through all the titles, but these are some of the books that I used to prepare this, okay? So here's the one on Gospel of Mary, and then here's the 13th Apostle, that's uh, the Gospel of Judas, and so on and so on, okay? So if you need these titles, the easiest way to do it, someone uh, uh, taught me, is to take a picture of them. How about that? Save the ink. All right, so... Um, we're going to do them in, we do these Gospels in this order, the Gospel of Thomas and then the Gospel of Judas. We may make it through both of those today. If not, we'll pick it up next week, and then uh, we'll focus on the Gospel of Mary Magdalene next week. One of the things I think that you'll notice is that these Gospels kind of look like Gospels. You know what I mean? They, they kind of look like the other ones. But there are reasons, theological reasons, historical reasons, why the early church decided not to include these in the canon of Scripture. And I'll, I'll show you why as we go through them. There were things that, um, just as there were uh, 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 theologians and church leaders who were pushing the church in a, in a certain direction, so part of that push was uh, what belonged in Scripture. What should be the authentic Scriptures and what are not. And uh, there, there was a set of uh, rules that they developed to, uh, to determine which ones would be in and which ones were not going to be in. And the three that we're going to take a look at didn't make the cut. Okay, they, they, did not, they did not survive the cut, but we have portions or all of all three of them. Uh, in the case of Judas and Thomas, or uh, Judas and Mary Magdalene, we don't have all of them. They did not survive. We don't, we don't have the entire uh, 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 Gospels, but we do have, uh, you know, selections or, or pieces of them. All right, so let's start with the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, so the Gospel of Thomas was in, discovered in its entirety in 1945. It was part of the uh, Nag Hammadi Library. Nag Hammadi is, uh, is uh, uh, located in the north northern part of Egypt. The Nag Hammadi Library is uh, primarily a Gnostic library, and uh, as is just was, as was the case with the Dead Sea Scrolls, there was a, a, a peasant who found this treasure trove, this library of ancient texts uh, in an ancient clay jar that was buried at the base of, of cliffs. So they had survived since the late 4th century, since the late 300s. And luck, luckily for us, uh, they were discovered by this... Uh, Egyptian guy. So the, uh, the Gospel of Thomas was not always known as the Gospel of Thomas. There were fragments of it found around the year 1895, just pieces, not the whole thing, uh, about 120 miles away from Nag Hammadi. 
And at that time, it was referred to either as the sayings of our Lord, the new sayings of Jesus, or fragments of a lost gospel. Makes sense, right? Good descriptive uh, 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 term. So the, one of the first things that you should notice about the Gospel of Thomas is that there is no narrative built around it. It is known as a sayings gospel. So, like, these are the secret sayings that the living Jesus spoke and Didymus, Judas, Thomas recorded. Number one, and he said, whoever discovers the interpretation of these sayings will not taste death. Number two, Jesus said, those who seek should not stop, stop seeking until they find. When they find, they will be disturbed. When they are disturbed, they will marvel and will rule over all, etc. So, uh, there is no uh, narrative framework. It's not like, well, uh, and so Jesus and the disciples went to the region of Caesarea Philippi and they came across a centurion and well, you don't have any of that. Okay? But keep this in mind. Sayings gospels are collections of sayings actually predate the four canonical gospels. And so the earliest uh, sayings collection, at least it is hypothesized, is that collection of Jesus' sayings known as Q that I have referenced before. Okay? And it's believed that Q helped shape Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? So sayings, sayings collections, or in this case a sayings gospel, actually were done before <coughs> the, the narrative framework kind of came around them. Okay, there are a, uh, the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of 114 sayings of Jesus. Um, the next point, the only original, or the only I should say, the only complete text of the Gospel of Thomas that we have, which is the one found at Nag Hammadi, is probably not identical to the original. In other words. Uh, there was an evolution in the formation of the Gospel of Thomas. And the reason why the scholars say that is because what they found at Nag Hammadi was not written in, in uh, Greek, but in Coptic, which is an Egyptian uh, kind of adaptation of, of the Greek. And the original probably would have been written in Greek, not in Coptic, okay? Um, so the Gospel of Thomas, it is theorized, was probably revised several times, as were the other Gospels, okay? Um, as I've mentioned, sayings collections like the Gospel of Thomas were pretty common in the ancient world. Um, in the Old Testament, the book, the book of Proverbs and the Wisdom of Solomon are both sayings collections. So sayings collections are not unique to the, the Gospel of Thomas uh, or to Q or anything like that. So the next question, who wrote the Gospel of Thomas? Why, it's obvious. It's Thomas, right? <laughs> I'm sure you know by now from having heard me and others that the guy whose name appears on the writing is probably not the guy who wrote it, okay? In most cases, that's what happened. So, the Gospel itself identifies the author as Didymus, Judas, Thomas. Now, the only authentic name of those three is Judas, because Didymus is the Greek word for twin, and Thomas is the Semitic word for twin. So, uh, so we, we need to ask the question, who was Judas the twin? Okay, uh, Thomas is a title rather than a, a, a proper name. So who is this guy? So Judas Thomas was a popular, kind of a legendary figure among the ancient Christians in Syria. Okay, um, and this Judas Thomas was often identified with the Apostle Thomas, who, as we know uh, in the Gospel of John, is identified as the twin. 
Okay? So, um, in the, the Syriac version, not the Greek version, but the Syriac version of the Gospel of John, uh, Judas the twin appears as Judas who is not the Iscariot. And he is also called Judas Thomas. So, there is also this uh, uh, other non-canonical uh, writing or scripture called the Acts of Thomas. The Acts of the Apostles was not the only book, uh, scriptural book in the early church known as Acts. There are other Acts. One of them is the Acts of Thomas. And in chapter 11 of that uh, book, Jesus appears disguised as Thomas. Jesus appears and he looks like Thomas. And he says, I am not Judas who is called Thomas, but I am his brother. So in the Acts of Thomas, Judas the twin is a brother of Jesus, which of course gets us into that question, did Jesus have brothers and sisters? Uh, if you're a Catholic, you say no way. If you're a Protestant, you say, of course he did. Okay, that's just, that's just one of those things. So, in, if, if you look in the gospel, the canonical gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verse 3, one of the brothers of Jesus is identified as Judas. Okay? So, that leads to the question, was the author of the gospel of Thomas the twin brother of Jesus? Probably not. <laughs> okay? Um, the... Keep in mind that the claim of apostolic authorship was common. So, you know, there is the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Mark, Luke, John, okay, uh, Judas, and, and uh, in, in all of those cases, the, the person whose name appears as the author is not the author. So why would they do that? Are they... Trying to pull the wool over our eyes? No. They are trying to give their scripture greater credibility, greater authority by ascribing authorship to an important person. Same thing happened with the Pentateuch. Uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. All of those are, according to legend, ascribed to uh, Moses. Moses didn't Moses didn't write them. Now, there might be people who would disagree with me, but I'll, I'll argue that one for quite a long time. Okay, so, bottom line, as, uh, as usual, we don't know who the author of the Gospel of Thomas is. After all of that, I don't know. Okay, so, next question. Where was the Gospel of Thomas written? I've already said that in the, the earliest church, um, there was, it was common to have a patron, let's say a, a, a patron authority. I, it's calling them a patron saint is probably a little bit too much. But like the church in Rome, their patron was Peter. The church in Asia Minor had John as their patron. Uh, the church of Jerusalem, it was James. Uh, in Alexandria, it was John Mark, the companion of Paul. And the, the, the patron apostle for Syria was Thomas, okay, Judas Thomas. So, some say that the Gospel of Thomas then would have been written in Syria. However, and how often do we have however is when we say these things, um, it makes more sense, even though Syria seems to be the, the right place, it makes more sense for a collection of Jesus sayings to have originated not in Syria, but in Palestine, in, in Israel, where the Jesus movement actually got started. Okay? Um, also, if you look at saying number 12, let's see if I can get there. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The disciples said to Jesus, We know that you are going to leave us 
who will be our leader. Uh, it appeals there, uh, Jesus said to them, no matter where you are, you are to go to James the just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. Well, how humble of him. <laughs> right? So, uh, it, he, Jesus appeals to James the just as an authority. And who is this James? This James was the leader of the Jerusalem community. So, you can make a case that the Gospel of Thomas would have been assembled in Palestine, in Israel, perhaps even in Jerusalem, by the Jerusalem community, but then you know, uh, 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 finished, or that it made its way to Syria and was attached to Thomas. Next question, when was the Gospel of Thomas written? Uh, it, once again, it's hard to say. Uh, because the Gospel of Thomas is a sayings collection. Because it's a sayings collection, uh, what usually happened with those is that they were written and then edited or redacted and re-edited you know, time and time again. So, the better way to phrase the question would be, when did the Gospel of Thomas begin? How did it continue? And when did it end? Okay, so when did it begin? All indications, or most indications, are that the Gospel of Thomas began to be written down around the end of the first century CE. Okay, why? <clears throat> first of all, because uh, sayings collections, as I've already mentioned, are a literary form common to the early Christian era. Okay, so you have Q that I've already mentioned, and you also have the collection of parables that appear in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Okay, however, Q, as we know, Q and the parables of, of the fourth chapter of Mark developed a narrative framework around them that did not happen with, uh, with the Gospel of uh, Thomas. Okay. Um, it survived merely as a saints collection. Second uh, bit of evidence. Jesus said to his disciples, compare me to something and tell me what I am like. You know, doesn't that sound like, who do people say that I am? Okay. Simon Peter said to him, you are like a just angel. Matthew said, you are like a wise philosopher. Thomas said to him, teacher, my mouth is utterly unable to say what you are like. So, um, Peter and Matthew appear like, you know, they're, they're not, you know, they just don't get it. Which is, I mean, how common is that for the apostles? They, they kind of look like the dummies, that they don't really, they're fools. They don't understand what Jesus uh, is about or his message. Um, yeah, so what does this indicate? Uh, this conflict among Simon Peter, Matthew, and Thomas. That there were apostolic rivalries. I already mentioned these patron things, right? So uh, you, th these apostolic rivalries, uh, Peter and Matthew, uh, if you look in... Paul's own writings. He confronts Peter, uh, you know, over the, the in in Jerusalem. He confronts the uh, other apostles in Caesarea. Those apostolic rivalries are a characteristic of the first century. When by the time we get to the second century, those apostolic rivalries are being minimized. So if you look in the Acts of the Apostles. It looks like everything is hunky dory, and they all reach agreement, and everything, and everything is cool. So, it. So the fact that there that, that this apostolic rivalry appears is an indication that the Gospel of Thomas is from the first century. Did any of that make sense? Did I explain that at all well? Okay. But and you had a question. Uh, what does it mean? He's been 
But Jesus said to them, no matter where you are, you are to go to James, the just, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being. That's giving him a greater title than, than mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it certainly gives uh, James a, a lot of authority, doesn't it? I mean, it, you know, uh, for whose sake heaven and earth, for whose sake heaven and earth came into being? That's ascribing a lot of authority to James. Keep in mind that you know, just because it says this, that's not saying that uh, you know somehow James participated in the act of creation or anything like that. Um, these folks are not writing. Uh, theology from an ontological or you know what I mean Greek uh, point of view they are writing from uh, a Hebraic uh, a Jewish point of view so he is I, I'm not sure exactly what he's saying when he says for whose sake heaven and earth came into being it makes it sound like God created the heavens and the earth just for him I would have to do more research into that particular verse to be able to answer that. But it certainly does give James a high degree of authority, doesn't it? No, this is the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus. Yes, yeah, the head of the Jerusalem community. Okay, Which is one of the reasons why uh, some theorize that the Gospel of Thomas would have been written within the Jerusalem community. Doesn't it sound something like uh, John, the apostle, when he talks about Jesus, someone greater than I will come up. Is well, that... when Jesus says, you know, well, he, he says the Father is, is greater than I. And, but when he says that someone else is going to be coming, it's the Holy Spirit, <coughs> right? The paraclete. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's hard to say, it's hard to transfer these sayings from one to another. Even though the words sound very similar. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. It Mark, helps. <laughs> what about when Jesus said from the cross, Behold, uh, this, is your, this is your mother. Yeah. Uh, who, did we ever decide who that was? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, the, the, the legend has it. It's the, it's the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh -huh. Okay? Now, in Christian tradition, in Catholic tradition, that that is John. John. Right? John. However, however, there's always a however. There are uh, plenty of scholars who will say that it was not John, that the disciple whom Jesus loved, and the word love is used most often to describe this follower, is Lazarus. Lazarus whom Jesus raised from the dead in the 11th chapter of John, that it's Lazarus rather than John. But it's not really, it's not clear. I didn't think Lazarus was even a disciple. Well, disciple meaning a follower. Yeah. Not one of the 12, but, but a follower. Okay, so there could be millions of disciples. Well, I don't know about millions, but uh, <laughs> at least a goodly number, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, you're... You're into scriptural hyperbole. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm in too deep. Millions, <laughs> millions of them. <laughs> okay, all right, so that's another indication that the Gospel of Thomas was written, or at least started in the first century, okay? One more bit of evidence that the Gospel of Thomas was started in the first century. In the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus is almost never referred to by any of the titles that became prominent as the Christian movement grew. So he's not referred to as Son of Man, Son of God, Messiah, Christ, or Lord. He is merely Jesus. So the fact that he is referred to most, almost always as Jesus is an indication of the early beginnings of, does that make sense? Early beginnings of, uh, of the Gospel of Thomas. Because those titles kind of were added on uh, as, as time went on. So how did the Gospel of Thomas continue? So let's look at number seven. High tech. 
Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat, so that the lion becomes human. Don't ask me what that means. And foul is the human that the lion will eat, and the lion still will become human. So, um, this image of the lion fits, is appropriate to the environment of the monks of northern Egypt, where Nag Hammadi was, but in the second century. So that's an indication that th this, this verse here, this saying, is an indication that the Gospel of Thomas was being edited and redacted at least into the second century. Okay? So then when did the process of editing end? The, the, the consensus is that the, the uh, editing process, the redaction process for the Gospel of Thomas probably did not end until about the time that the version that we have was buried at, at Nag Hammadi. So late 4th century, it just continued to be added on to and you know, d d uh, subtracted from. There's just so much, um, uh, so many things happened to these, uh, er all of these early scriptures. Okay, uh, think about, just for example, uh, the copying process. These, these people were, um, they weren't perfect. So there are, in the, in the manuscripts of, of, the, the God, of the scriptures that we have, there are literally thousands of errors. Just typos. Well, you can't call them typos, but... <laughs> printos, how's that? There's, there's, you know, they're, they're all over the place. And then there were times when the copyists would say, wait a minute. I want Jesus to say this, not that. And they felt free to add or detract, take away, subtract words from the sacred scripture. So my, that's always one of my questions to those who uh, talk about literal inerrancy. What is the literal text? What is the text that is inerrant? We don't know. We don't have any of them. All right, end of that sermon. So, what sort of Christianity is reflected in the Gospel of Thomas? Let's ask, ask that question. The Thomas community were social radicals. Okay? They were the Alexandria ocasio Cortezes of their time, if you want to use a, a comparison. All right? Radical? Ah, she's not radical. Sorry about no. that. So they were, they, were, they were wanderers. They were itinerants, just like Jesus himself. So now I have to scroll way down. I don't know how to scroll any faster. If anybody does. Page down. That's what I'm doing. Oh, page down. i got to go to number 55. So, all right. Any speed readers? Words <laughs> misspelled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Jesus said, whoever does not hate father and mother cannot be my disciple. That sounds familiar, right? And whoever does not hate brothers and sisters and carry the cross as I do will not be worthy of me. And then, number 80. Tell I, I want to take the time to do this so that you actually see the text. Jesus said, whoever has uh, come to know the world has discovered the body, and whoever has discovered the body of that one, the world is not worthy. Now, what my research told me is that those verses indicate that the Thomas Christians were wanderers. In other words, they were, and, and I, I don't see it all that clearly, so I take their word for it, but they were people who did not stay in, in one place. Yeah, David? Were they individual wanderers or, quote, group? Group, group wanderers. Although, as time went on, there were individual uh, hermits who, you know, who wandered around and were found in, in Syria and in the Middle East for centuries after this movement fell apart. Okay. So we're basically talking about nomads. Nomads. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nomads in imitation of Jesus, who himself was 
nomadic or who was a wanderer. Okay? Um, they were very critical of Jewish poverty. Uh, they were very cr cr critical of the distinction between pure and impure people or clean and unclean people. Uh, and, and, and they were very critical of purity as uh, a measure of human worth. So, uh, saying number 69, which won't take as long to get to. Jesus said, congratulations <laughs> to those who have been persecuted in their hearts. They are the ones who have truly come to know the Father. Congratulations to those who go hungry, so the stomach of the one in want may be filled. Okay? Uh, persecuted in their hearts. Persecuted because of their social status. Persecuted because they are uh, impure or unacceptable. Okay? Um, and there's other... No, let's, do, let's do one more. Is that where the Beatitudes started? Where? You mean from here? Yeah. Uh, I doubt whether the Beatitudes uh, came from the Gospel of Thomas. The, uh, the Beatitudes, uh, I will bet, I don't have the Q Gospel memorized, but I would take a guess and say that the Beatitudes came from the Q Gospel. Yeah. Jesus said, there was a rich man who had a great deal of money. He said, I shall invest my money so that I may sow, reap, plant, and fill my storehouses with produce that I may lack nothing. That sounds familiar too, doesn't it? These were the things he was thinking in his heart, but that very night he died. Anyone here with two ears had better listen. Okay? Um, yeah. But here's, here's the difference between the Gospel of Thomas community and the synoptic communities, the Matthew, Mark, Luke communities. The Matthew, Mark, and Luke communities became more domesticated and less radical as time went on. Okay? Uh, because they wanted their communities to grow. And radical communities usually tend not to grow because they're, they're radical, and most people don't want to be radicals. Okay? And so those communities tend to, you know, to, to, to tolerate um, and accept a, a more um, standard lifestyle. But the uh, Thomas movement never changed. It never wavered. Okay? Uh, as, I, as I just said, there were Gnostic Christian monks roaming around the, the landscape in Syria for centuries, for a long, long time. So they just did, they didn't go away. Now, <clears throat> the theology of the Gospel of Thomas. Yes. Yeah. So like oh, sure. guess, but how did they support themselves just wandering around? In the uh, frequently it would be by begging. No. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, so, so the theology of the Gospel of Thomas. Because it's a sayings collection, the Gospel of Thomas falls under the, the genre, the literary genre of wisdom literature. Uh, and so it reflects wisdom theology, like the book of, of Proverbs in the Old Testament. So it, it, it answers, uh, being wisdom, it answers very practical questions, like what is the world like? What are people like? What does it mean to be wise and prudent? Who am I? What is my place in the big scheme of things? Those are the kinds of questions that wisdom, uh, wisdom literature asks. The Gospel of Thomas, similar to the Apostle Paul, or to the, the missionary Paul, had a quite negative attitude toward the world. And so to understand the world as it really is, we should not rely on human wisdom, but rely on God's wisdom. So Paul, Paul, in the first letter to the Corinthians, talks about relying on the wisdom of God, which is superior to human wisdom. And in number 17, Jesus said, I will give you what no eye has seen, 
what no ear has heard, what no hand has touched, what has not arisen in the human heart. In other words, wisdom that comes from above, not something that's superior to human wisdom. Okay. So in the Gospel of Thomas, this world is considered an evil and inferior place. These, these folks are uh, Gnostics. And we've talked about Gnosticism before, the Gnostic sects before. And they considered the world of matter, the world of tactility, of, of the material world, to be evil and inferior. And so it was the task of the Gnostic Christian to um, <coughs> rise above the material world and seek the spiritual world. Okay? That was their task. Um, and, 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 and Paul shared that same attitude. But the Gospel of Thomas's response to the world is not the same as Paul. What did Paul say? Paul said, in, you know, we're, we're living in, a, in an evil time. Wait for the return of the Son of Man. Okay? The Son of Man is going to come back very soon. The Gospel of Thomas, on the other hand, agrees more with the Gospel of John. John has Jesus depart from the world to go to another place where his apostles will someday also go. Okay? Uh, Jesus promises his apostles that someday they will return to God. And I guess I should maybe have just put these in some kind of order. Number 49. Jesus said, Congratulations to those who are alone and chosen, for you will find the Father's domain, for you have come from it, and you will return there again. Okay? <clears throat> Jesus uh, promises his apostles, both in the Gospel of Thomas and in the Gospel of John, that they will return to God. Okay. So do um, I have said already that these these folks are Gnostics. Should I should I give a a, a brief review of the, of the Gnostic theology real quick? Not necessary. Necessary. Yeah, All right. Heads, heads are like yeah. it's a modified. Yeah, I guess so. All right. <laughs> so we said that the that the, the Gnostics are a group of of early Christian sects, denominations if you will, that uh, have multiple origins, Persian, Greek, Jewish, Christian, even Hindu, Egyptian influences. They believed, they all believed in a supreme God, a supreme God who had no intention of creating anything. A supreme God was, who was supremely happy in himself. Okay? There was then, it, but there, this, this God, we talked about how this God, uh, by thinking about himself, created an aeon or an, or an image of himself. In other words, a lesser copy, kind of a, a lesser clone of himself. And that, that that cloning kind of process or emanation process continued over and over again. So there are multiple uh, Gnostic pantheons. There are different Gnostic uh, assemblies of gods. One of these lesser gods who goes either by the name of Demiurge, or Yaldabaoth, or Sacklus, or, you know, there's all these different names, tricks the uh, Supreme God into creating a world, or creates the world without the knowledge of the Supreme God. Okay? And this, yeah, and this world that, 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 that the Demiurge cr creates is extremely uh, divided between good and evil. Okay? So, uh, human beings are both good and evil. We have both body, which is evil, and soul, our spirit, which is good. Some of humanity has been endowed by Demiurge with a spark of the divinity of the Supreme God that he stole from the Supreme God. Okay? So, the, the, this Demiurge was able to, you know crack into the bank and steal some of the Supreme God's divinity and infuse that into those who were the chosen ones. Okay? So this table and this table are the chosen ones. The rest of you, 
good luck. <laughs> so, so, uh, so then Jesus came. What, what, what's the role of Jesus in all of this? Jesus came not to save everyone from their sins. Jesus came to reveal to those who had received that spark of divinity their true identity. Their true identity as, uh, as being part of God. Okay? That, and how did Jesus do that? By giving them some kind of secret knowledge. That's the gnosis. G-N-O-S-I-S. Jesus imparts that gnosis to those who are saved. They are then saved. There's nothing they can do to lose it. Okay, so then upon their death, they return. Their spirit rises up to back to God, and they become one with God. All right? So that, for our purposes, that's one, of the, that's one of the keys. Well, there are several keys. First of all, the supreme God did not create as we as, as Christians, Catholic Christians, believe. The supreme God did not create. Some other God created. Okay? According to the Gnostics, it was the God of the Old Testament. Yahweh, Sabaoth, or Yalda Baoth. Um, Christians believe that we, we are divided. I mean, we have evil impulses and also good impulses. We are not, we're not split. We're not divided. It's not that our bodies are evil and that our spirit is good. We are good. That's what the, the book of Genesis affirms. And so what did Jesus come to do? That's, I think, one of those the, the key differences. Jesus came to save the elect, the chosen ones, from their ignorance of their, their themselves. The ign their ignorance of their true self. What is their true self? Their true self is that they've been given the spark of divinity by the Supreme God. Okay? And Jesus uh, teaches them through this secret knowledge who they really are. That's salvation. It's not being saved from one's sins. It is being saved from ignorance of the true self. All right? So that's a primer of, uh, of Gnostic theology. Imagine if Gnostic theology has won the battle. We might, we might think very differently, right, about who we are. All right. Um, so what is, the, what is the place of the Thomas community in early Christianity. The Thomas community is, an, is a very early example of Gnostic Christianity, and the Gospel of Thomas reflects that. The Gospel of Thomas also reflects, to a certain extent, the theology of the Gospel of John. Uh, and it appears, it appears likely that the uh, John community was familiar with the Thomas community. In fact, uh, one of the authors that I read believes that the Gospel of John was written in part to refute the Gospel of Thomas. Okay? Um, and, and here's how. In, in, the, in the Gospel of Thomas, uh, yeah, all right, so let me back up here. I'm getting ahead of myself. So in both the Gospel of Thomas and in the Gospel of John, Jesus gives kind of private teaching to the disciples, okay? But in the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus is described... It, as, as this teacher, being this teacher, as the light. He is the light that came into the world. Okay? Jesus is the light. And for John, Jesus is God's only light. Jesus is God's only begotten Son. <clears throat> the Gospel of Thomas is different because it says that not only is Jesus the light, but everyone who has received that spark of divinity, that gnosis, is also has the light. 
Okay? Now, so what? What does that say? What that says and why the, the, the proto-Orthodox Church rejected that is because if you and you and you and I have the light in us, what don't we need? We don't need any other authority. We have Jesus, we have the hotline to Jesus. We we you know we have Jesus' cell number. Okay? So I don't need, if I have a direct line to Jesus, I don't need any other authority. In other words, I don't need a bishop to tell me who I am or what to believe. But the Proto-Orthodox said, oh, yes, you do. Because, and that's why, one of the reasons why they accepted the Gospel of John is because they said, only Jesus is God, has God's light. Jesus is the light of the world. And then remember, Jesus passes on that light, that truth, to whom? To his apostles. And then to whom after that? The bishops. Not us. Oh, no. no. <laughs> not, not us, but to the bishops. And so it is the bishops who are the ultimate authorities. Not individual believers. You see how that, that, that's one of the ways that the Gospel of Thomas and the Gospel of John and proto-Orthodox Christianity and Gnostic Christianity are quite different. Okay? Yeah? I don't know yes. if you went over this when we did the Gnostic Gospels, but did we talk about why the proto-Orthodox were able to, why their beliefs were able to overcome the Gnostic? Was it because they had uh, more influential backers? Was it, I mean, what caused that shift? The, uh, the I mean, there was a, there was a, theolo there was theological conflict, which sometimes erupted into violence, that was going on even before the Council of Nicaea. Mm -hmm. But the Council of Nicaea was called in part to refute both the Gnostic view and also the view of Arius. Okay? Um, and so in 325, the, the Council of Nicaea, you know, affirmed the Orthodox, <coughs> or the Proto-Orthodox position, and then it was reaffirmed at the Council of Constantinople in 381. That did not kill either Gnostic Christianity or Arian Christianity, but it elevated Proto-Orthodox Christianity into the... But why? Why was it that... Why was it that vision that came, that rose to the top, as it were? Uh, because uh, more people just believed it, and they, they pushed their position harder. So people like Irenaeus, people like Hippolytus, people like uh, Athanasius and Alexander and uh, the, um, the Cappadocians, it just so happened that their positions won the day. They were able to convince more of the, the local bishops you know, who then convinced their people that this is the right way to go. But it was, it was very, very, very much a political battle. Okay, it was a political struggle as to which form of Christianity was going to win out. And Orthodox Christianity did not really win, so to speak, for, for centuries. I mean, the, the German tribes that, uh, that converted to Christianity uh, in the, four, the, the fifth century on were largely Aryan Christians. Uh, it, they weren't. They didn't become real Christians until maybe I want to say maybe the eighth or ninth century. So it was quite a long evolution to reach, you know, the, the stage where the proto-orthodox or the proto-orthodox view became the orthodox view. But can't you, can't you see why though that this, or at least what I'm hearing you say and what this is the first time I've been exposed to it, but this. Thomas area is more exclusive, more limiting, because those who saw the light, these two tables, and the rest of the year, good luck. You know, yeah. that that brings that whole family group down a lot. 
as that, opposed to, hey, I'm here to save everybody. You're exactly right, Lee. It, the, the, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, the, the Gnostic Christianity was exclusive. You know, there were only, only some who were the elect. The thing about the Gnostics is that they didn't set up their own church communities. They would worship with everybody else, all those other poor slobs who had no chance. But they were, they were the elite. They were the ones who really knew. They were on the inside, and so they would gather outside of the church community and celebrate their elite status, so to speak. <laughs> and, and, yeah, that's one of the reasons why the proto-orthodox view won out. It was, it was more, it was more inclusive. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't make it better necessarily, but it made it, made it more inclusive, and that's that's in history. That's what won. That's what won the day. And the bishops get to keep their job. <laughs> did Ken? Did you have something? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I was just wondering what the circumstances were for the uh, uh, bearing of, of these scrolls. Yeah. If they had not, if they, you know, as I said, the Nag Hammadi uh, scriptures are a library. So some poor little librarians thought. Uh, and, and the reason why he did it is because those books would have been burned. Mm -hmm. After the Council of uh, Constantinople, it was like, we need to get rid of these other heresies, these other false teachings. And so he buried it. He buried these things so that they wouldn't be burned. That's why the Nazis burned so many books, too, I imagine. I don't know if the Nazis were book burners or not, or oh, yeah. scroll burners. They have pictures of that. The Gnostics? Yeah. Are you talking about 20, 20th century Gnostics? Oh, no. I'm talking about World War II. They yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, no, you're talking about the Nazis, not the Gnostics. Oh, no, I didn't say Gnostics. Oh, oh, you said Nazis. Okay. Sorry about that, Lee. <laughs> My understanding was that the, the community at Qumran was concerned about the Romans destroying uh, their manuscripts, and that's the reason they put them in the caves. And I was wondering if there was something similar going on down. But you, you say it more. It was a, a Christian movement. It was to protect them from other Christians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, after the Council of Constantinople, well, even after the Council of Nicaea, there were persecutions of non-Orthodox Christians. I mean, yeah, if, if, if you were not an Orthodox Christian, not a Nicene Christian, you, you uh, faced possible persecution. So the church that began as a persecuted church became a persecuting church over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's just a historical fact. Yeah. When, when was the burning of the library in Alexandria? I don't know. Anybody, I, can anybody help me with that? I don't remember. I'll find it. Okay. Allison, we'll look that up. <laughs> Thank you. you yeah, Google that. Google. The, the wonders of Google. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mark, before you go there. Yeah. We are, we are bypassing the pure critical argument. The question becomes how do I, as an individual person, get to heaven? Yeah. And the Gnostic view of that is through spirituality and not necessarily good works and sharing. So part of that war was also about how you became heavenly. Yes. So there's a theological component to this as well. Well, there is. I mean, I, you know, the, the um, proto-Orthodox Christianity did not discount the spiritual. But it did focus more on works. Uh, so second century Christians were noted for their, their care for the poor among them. And it was especially the task of the deacons to oversee the, the, you know, the, the, the care of the poor. It's also true that the, uh, it, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was all Christians or just the proto-Orthodox or whatever, there were a couple of things that made them stand out. One was their opposition to abortion, which was 
common in the Roman Empire. It was, you know, illegal and not, not uncommon. The second was that they refused to serve in the military. They were pacifists. And the third is that they refused to participate in the, uh, the, the Roman festivals that uh, honored the, the emperors and the divinity of the emperors. So I'm not really answering your question directly, but um, bo both parties you know, did have a, a component of spirituality to them. It's just th their, their understanding of who they were vis-a-vis Jesus and vis-a-vis -vis God was, was quite different. And the, in particular, their understanding of authority and where authority lies. For the Gnostics, it was the individual conscience. I am my own authority because Jesus has given me this knowledge. For the Proto-Orthodox, it was listen to the bishop because the bishop has received the real knowledge from the apostles and ultimately from Jesus. Pretty big difference. I mean, that's a huge difference, really. Alexandria burned in 48 BC when Caesar burned the Egyptian fleet. There you have it. So that's quite. So, with, yeah. That's similar before. Tenet. Yeah, but not a lot before. Not a lot before, yeah. But totally different circumstances. Caesar uh, finally, that's um, uh, Octavian, Caesar Augustus you know, struggled for quite a while and finally overcame Cleopatra, our friend Cleopatra, Liz Taylor, and Mark, <laughs> Mark Antony in 31 BC. And that was the end of the, or that's when he declared the end of the Republic and the beginning of the monarchy or the empire. So that was part of that struggle. All right, enough about the Gospel, or any, any other questions about the Gospel of Thomas? You ready for the Gospel of Judas? We'll at least get started. We have a little bit more of the that power. And you can find these texts, if you like, you can find these texts uh, online. You can, you can read the Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary, any of these, on your own today. <coughs> Do they have a Neil Upstead and Imprimatur? Um, gee whiz. I, I'm gonna, off the top of my head, I'm going to say no. <laughs> okay. So, first thing to note about the Gospel of Judas is that uh, its discovery initiated uh, a controversy. So you may have actually seen this special, but in 2006, National Geographic had a special about the Gospel of Judas. Um, and the, and, and the, the National Geographic special actually said that Judas was a friend of Jesus. And some of the books that I have here, some very uh, highly regarded authors like Elaine Pagels, um, Karen King, Bart Ehrman uh, mirrored that sentiment that the Gospel of Judas made Judas out to be a friend of Jesus. A year later, uh, a better interpretation, one that has now pretty much uh, achieved consensus among scholars, was put forth by April DeConnick in her book, The Thirteenth Apostle. The Connick says that all these other people, Pagels, National Geographic, Ehrman, are wrong because uh, Judas should not be construed as a friend of Jesus or as a hero, but rather he should be viewed as a demon. She says that the, these other scholars mistranslated the Gospel of Judas. Okay. The National Geographic version made Judas into a good man by saying that he would be the 13th, quote, spirit whose star would ascend beyond the stars of the other disciples. The Conics translation says that Judas is evil, not, not blessed in any way. Okay? So 
National Geographic translated the Coptic word daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N. Do I have that in the notes? No. Oh, rats. Okay, D-A-I-M-O-N. National Geographic translated that Coptic word as spirit. The Conic translates it as demon, daimon, D-A-I-M-O-N, an evil spirit. So there's another, there another word, porje, porje, in the Gospel of Judas, Judas asks Jesus why he has shared the secret knowledge with him since Jesus has, quote, set me apart, Judas, set him apart, which means he's included him with, among those who are saved. The conic says that the correct translation should not be since he has set me apart with the saved, but separated me from the saved, which is a question that makes more sense. Let me, let me think about this. Just, just, or let's think about this just for a second. So Judas says to Jesus, why have you shared the gnosis with me? National Geographic says, since I am one of the saved. Well, if he is one of the saved, then of course you would share the Gnosis with him. The Conic says, uh, why have you shared the Gnosis with me since I am separated from you? Now that question makes a lot more sense, right? If Judas is a, a demon and separated from the others, from the twelve, then it makes sense for Judas to ask the question, why did you share Gnosis with me, since I'm not really one of the elect? Okay? I know I'm really getting down into the weeds here, but... Uh, um, the in the National Geographic version, Jesus says to Judas, they will curse your ascent to the holy generation. The Conic translate that, translates that same verse as, you will not ascend to the holy mountain. So you, you can see the differences, okay? All right, enough of that. So what is the basic message of the Gospel of, Ju of Judas? According to De Conic, the Gospel of Judas is a dialogue, a dispute, really, between... Uh, the Proto-Orthodox and another group of Christians known as Sethian Christians. Okay? So, who were the Sethians? Here we are with another group of, of, of Christians. Okay, so the, the Sethians were perhaps one of the most, or perhaps the most important of the Gnostic sects. Okay? So the Sethians went through all, you know, all kinds of uh, evolution. Um, they were not Christian for a while. They became Christianized. They became estranged from Christianity and became aligned with the Platonists, the philosophers. And then they even rejected Platonism and kind of, kind of broke up into, into fragments. Okay. Uh, that all that happened between about the first century before Christ to the second century after Christ. So there was quite a, uh, an evolution there. All right. So who wrote the Gospel of Judas? You know the answer already, <laughs> right? The Gospel of Judas, as you might imagine, was probably written by someone from the Sethian Christian community. And its purpose was to criticize proto-Orthodox Christianity. And the way that it did it is by criticizing the Twelve Apostles, right? Who are held up by the proto-Orthodox as the legitimate authorities. The Gospel of Judah says, no, the, 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 uh, the uh, Apostles are not legitimate authorities. They also uh, criticized the proto-Orthodox view that Jesus' death was a necessary sacrifice for the purpose of atonement, for the redemption from sin. I mean, they're Gnostics. They're not going to accept that. Okay? And, and when, if you think about it, there is a logic to it. The Sethians found 
this uh, belief that God would ask his own son to die, that God would sacrifice his own son, they found that to be scandalous, morally reprehensible. How in the heck would a good God give up his own son to death in order to atone for some sin committed against God? They thought that was... They, they thought that was morally reprehensible, that it was an act of child sacrifice, that it was an act of murder. So they said God would not do that, and they, and they rejected that interpretation, <clears throat> that proto-Orthodox interpretation. Okay? Um, yeah, we've already been through all of that. So, do you see the, 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 the basis upon which, or, the, or the, 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 the fundamental reason why the Gospel of Judas was written? Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Mark, in a simpler definition of, of Judas that I've read and, and supported by Smithsonian and some of the other ones, that Judas joined Christ as a disciple because he thought he was going to be the savior and get rid of the Romans and right. and he became a zealot. A, a zealot. A zealot. Yeah. And then he was disappointed when he did not act as the zealots thought that he would take yeah, he did, power. And he, didn't want, he didn't want to commit violence. Jesus yeah. didn't want to commit violence. Yeah, and they were dead set on getting rid of the Romans, so they said, okay, well, we'll do this, and hopefully that will spur him to act quicker. Yeah. And I haven't heard the word zealots in any of this. No, because this is a very different, uh, this is a very different Judas. Mm -hmm. oh, it's a different Judas? Well, it's... I think that's that. It's the same guy, yeah. but it's a very different depiction of him, okay. which shouldn't be terribly surprising. <laughs> you know, by now. They all seem confused at what they're doing. But. Well, they, they, they're, they're clear about what they believe. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a dispute over who Jesus is, who John is, who Judas is. They can't agree on hardly any of this. Okay. Okay? Which but they all had following. There, there were zealots. He was oh yeah, and, and Judas was one of them. So what you're saying is 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 plausible in history. Okay. Well, we're looking at the theology behind the Gospel of Judas. Okay. Okay. In other words, I'm just a little confused. It might not be all, it might not all be factual, but it's all true. <laughs> Depending on where you're coming. I've heard from. that before. Heard that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, what are some of the key theological issues in the Gospel of Judas? The first one is the authority question. Okay. So, the Gospel of Judas addresses this question. Who should Christians turn to as their authority? Should they turn to Scripture? Should they turn to tradition? To institutional leaders? Or to conscience? You, can, you probably know the answer to the question. For the Sethians, for the Gospel of Judas community, it was the individual conscience that is the final authority. Why? Because that conscience is, for them, a piece of God within them. Okay? That spark of divinity that is within them. So, the, the Sethians believed that external authority, apostles and bishops, was a trap. Okay? A way of imposing, this is, these are their words, imposing their own ignorance and arrogance on believers. Okay? The Sethians were especially skeptical of this uh, belief known as apostolic succession. I've explained apostolic succession before, that Jesus had this, you know, box of truth, and it's, everything was right there in the box, and it was all clear, and he handed it off to the apostles, and they all, you know, kept it and protected it and, and preserved it verbatim, and pass it on to their successors, the bishops. So the bishops have the box, right? And those who are subjects of the, the bishops should turn to the bishops for, the, for the, the, the discernment of the truth of Jesus' message. Don't look to yourself, okay? Because your, your conscience, it easily falls into error look to the bishop, and the bishop will let you know what's the right thing to believe. The Sethians said, I don't think so. Okay, they, they looked to the individual conscience. 
as the ultimate authority. Okay. The Sethians uh, were especially fond of the Gospel of Mark because in the Gospel of Mark, more than any of the other canonical Gospels, the Apostles are depicted as ne never, never truly getting it, okay? They're both ignorant and faithless. Even after the resurrection in the Gospel of Mark, the, the Apostles are asking questions about who gets to sit at your right hand and, you know, and, all, and, and at your left and all that. And Jesus kind of goes... You know, after all of this, you still don't get it, okay? Um, another thing, in the Gospel of Mark, who is it that first recognizes who Jesus is? It's not the apostles. It is the demons, and it is people who are possessed by demons, who, you know, you are the Son of God, and he's like, shh. Remember the the the, the, uh, the messianic secret, okay? So uh, they they the, the Sathians, you know, pick up on that. All right. Uh, the next uh, key issue in the gospel, theological issue in the gospel of Judas, is um, the fancy word is soteriology or the theology of salvation. What does it mean to be saved? Okay. The Sethians were like the, the Thomas community. They did not uh, like this view that God offered up his son in atonement for the sin of, of Adam or the sins of human beings. Okay? Um, all right. Uh, the, the, the death of Jesus. Well, another key theological issue in the Gospel of Judas has to do with the death of Jesus. According to the Gospel of Judas, Judas helped to kill only Jesus' body, not his spirit, because his spirit is eternal. But at his death, Jesus' spirit was released, and it conquers the power of evil that, that ruled the world. Okay? So it didn't matter whether Jesus' body was killed. His spirit was not. Okay. All right. Let's now look at a, a, a quick little summary of the Gospel of Judas. Let's actually look at the text itself. The beginning. This is the secret message, the secret message of judgment. Jesus spoke with Judas Iscariot over a period of eight days, three days before he celebrated Passover. When he appeared on earth, he did signs and great wonders for the salvation of humanity. Some walked in the way of righteousness, but others walked in their transgression, so the twelve disciples were called. He started to tell them about the mysteries beyond the world and what would happen at the end. Often, he didn't reveal himself to his disciples, but you'd find him in their midst as a child. Sounds, like, sounds more like a gospel, doesn't it? Look at the first title. Jesus criticizes the disciples. Now, that's not in the text. But that's what is in the text itself. So the Gospel of Judas uh, begins in the middle. It begins on page 33 of this uh, codex, the Chacos Codex, which is an Egyptian uh, Coptic, Coptic papyrus, okay, that was discovered in the 1970s. Um, on page 33, that's where we are, uh, Jesus criticizes the apostles for not knowing wh what their Eucharist is really doing. Okay, so uh, Jesus is criticizing the apostles by saying that their Eucharist is not giving worship to the Supreme God, the Gnostic Supreme God, but to this inferior, evil, creator God, Yaldabaoth, or Demiurge. Okay, that's who they're really worshiping. In other words, the, the apostles are missing the boat. And this is Jesus saying this to the apostles. Then he, uh, he criticizes them uh, for not knowing who he is. Jesus said to them, well, they said, Master, you are the Son of, uh, of our God. Jesus said to them, How do you know me? Truly I say to you, no generation of the people among you will know me. In other words, none of the proto-Orthodox 
know who I am. None of the proto-Orthodox know who I, Jesus, really am. Then, Uh, Master, you remember Jesus said, when it's a sign they began to, to curse it in their hearts. They're cursing Jesus in their hearts. Um, we were All right, here we go. So Jesus notices their ignorance. He says, why are you letting your anger trouble you? Has your God within you and his stars become angry with your souls? If any of you is strong enough among humans to bring out the perfect humanity, stand up and face me. All of them said, oh, we're strong enough. But their spirits weren't brave enough to stand before him. You see how the apostles keep being uh, denigrated? Except Judas Iscariot. He was able to stand before him, but he couldn't look him in the eye. So he looked away. Judas said to him, I know who you are and where you've come from. You've come from the immortal realm of Barbalo. And I'm not worthy to utter the name of the one who sent you. I'm not worthy to utter the name of the one who sent you. The name of the one who sent Jesus is this supreme God of the Gnostics. Okay? So then Jesus says, well, what do you know? You, Judas, who are possessed by a demon, echoes of the Gospel of Mark, you know who I am. And these other supposed insiders, the apostles, they don't know who I am. Does that make sense? Peter knew who he was, right? He said you were uh, Not here. Oh, was this a girl? <laughs> yeah, okay. not here he doesn't. Okay. Okay? Right. Remember, the author of the Gospel of Judas and the Sethians are criticizing all of the apostles because they are considered to be false authorities. The apostles and their successors, the bishops, are not the true authorities according to the Gospel of Judas. Who appointed these bishops? Uh, well, uh, all right, the 15 second question. For a number of centuries, they were elected by the Christian community. So lean back in the day, you would have had a shot. <laughs> However, wow, I can't believe <laughs> I have a pretty credit at the table. I don't have a right. So there's one no vote for you. <laughs> Boy, how easily they get you. <laughs> uh, maybe if you shared your uh, your snacks with them. Maybe they're good. <laughs> so you know, so there are there are actually times when a bishop when a bishop was elected by a Christian community, that bishop would have to get baptized before he and then become uh, ordained before he could become the bishop. They would select just the best person. They selected who they thought was the best person. To be their leader. Uh, That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a charismatic type of election. Needless to say, that's, you know, that's not the way it is anymore. That's the way <laughs> it was, okay? Um, then, the, uh, let's say, yeah, I already said that. Then, uh, Judas said to him, when will you tell me these things, and when will the great day of light dawn for the generation? But when he said these things, Jesus left. So Jesus just walks away. But he comes back. The next morning, <laughs> he appeared to his disciples, and they said to him, Master, where did you go, and what did you, what did you do when you left us? He said, I went to another great and holy generation, etc., etc., etc. They say, Lord, what great generation is better and holier than us? That's not in these realms. Now, when Jesus heard this, he laughed. So he's laughing at the apostles, and he said, Why are you wondering in your hearts about the holy, the strong and holy generation? Truly, I say to you, no one born of this realm will see that generation. No army of angels from the stars, no person of mortal earth will be able to join it, etc., etc., etc. Okay? When his disciples heard these things, they were each troubled in their spirit. I imagine they would be. Because yeah. he's pretty much, you know, uh, eliminating them from contention. Another day, Jesus came up to them. They said to him, Master, we've seen you in a dream because we had great dreams last night. Why, the text is, there's a hole in the text, why, hidden yourselves? And, the, and they said, we saw a great house 
with a great altar and 12 people. We'd say they were priests and a name and a crowd of people was waiting at the altar. The, the priests finished receiving the offerings. We kept waiting. Um, some fast for two weeks. Others sacrificed their own children. Others their wives, praising and humbling themselves along the way. Okay, on, on and on and on. So, um, in, the, in the first little section that I, I read, Jesus is telling the apostles that they won't be part of the holy generation. And, that, and, and they, they, they believe they are the holiest generation, and that's when Jesus laughs at them. Okay? Then they tell him about this vision that they've seen, uh, in which Jesus appears in, with a great temple, 12 priests are sacrificing, invoking Jesus' name, etc., etc., Jesus then tells them, moving on, that they did not see a vision, but that they had a nightmare. <laughs> he says that it is the apostles themselves who were the priests offering the sacrifices, and that the God to whom they were offering their sacrifices is not the real God, the supreme God, but this Yalda Ba'oth, this inferior God, this creator God. Okay, so they're totally missing the boat. And he says that on the last day, they'll be judged very harshly for what they're, what they're doing. Um, then, I got down to 44 and 45, and I don't know where they are. Let's see if I get down to 44. Okay. Uh, Judas said, Master, just as you've listened to all of them, now listen to me too, because I've seen a great vision. But Jesus laughed when he heard this. He said to him, why are you all worked up, you 13th demon? But speak up, and I'll bear with you. Jesus said, Judas said to him, in the vision I saw myself, the 12 disciples are stoning me and chasing me. And I also came to the place where I had followed you. I saw a house and my eyes couldn't believe it or measure its size. Great people surrounded it. And that house had a roof of greenery. In the middle of the house was a crowd. Like, Master, take me in with these people. Jesus answered and said, Your star has led you astray, Judas. And that no person of mortal birth is worthy to enter the house you've seen because that place is reserved for those who are holy. All right. So... What is all of this? There's this stuff about uh, Judas and the star. The, the gist of it is this, because for the sake of time, I'm, I'm cutting to the chase a little bit rather than staying in the weeds. The gist of it is this, that there is, uh, well, that, that Judas, it is Judas's fate. It is his star that he will betray Jesus. It, it, there's nothing he can do about it. Remember I talked before in one of a previous series about this thing that whatever is happening on earth, there's also it's also taking place in the heavens. So these stars refer to the cosmic versions of the apostles and how they're wrong. Judas is the 13th star, which makes him not only a demon, but the chief of the demons, okay, the, the head of them. He's he's worse than than all of them, okay. So Judas, as as much as he wants to avoid his fate, he can't because it's it's literally in the stars that that's what is that's what he's going to do. So Judas is caught up in this supernatural drama over which he has no control. He is not a human actor who is betraying Jesus. Uh, instead, his star is lined up with the demons who rule the world. And these demons are at war with the supreme God. Um, so Judas' spirit, his star, is the 13th demon who is trying to carry out the plan of this uh, inferior god, Yalda Baal. Okay, I mean, that's a little different, isn't it? Does that go back to the Gnostics didn't believe that we had free will, that everything was preordained, and that we, that we didn't have a choice in matters? 
Well, the choice that we don't have, according to the Gnostics, is whether we're saved or not. Okay? But this, I don't think, you know, this reflects uh, not just Gnostic thinking, but a lot of Middle Eastern thinking among, you know, the, the Greeks, the Romans, the Egyptians, that, you know, they, they all were believers, the Mesopotamians, they all were believers in astrology. That you were born under a certain sign that the movement of the stars and planets if read correctly would tell you what was going to happen the gospels reflect this in Luke how do we know or in Matthew rather how do we know that Jesus is about to be born we have seen his star in the east okay so astrology was you know was was uh, was very common in that part of the of the ancient world and you see it reflected very clearly in the gospel of judas that there's this cosmic drama going on right i mean think about to to, to draw an analogy think about the uh the the battle between the cosmic battle between god and satan that battle is being fought in the heavens and it's also being fought here on earth that there's a battle between good and evil on earth that God will ultimately win but that there is this this battle that's still in our day and age there are people who you know who, who believe that kind of thing that will make me do it <laughs> well yeah did he yeah. oh he did okay. <laughs> So, okay. What else can I say? All right, one, yeah, one last thing. One last little thing. It's about two minutes. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Well, I guess I'm so confused. So, was Judas human at all, or was he just always a demon? Well, according to the Gospel of Judas, he is a human being, but he is a human being who is a demon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he he is he is uh, an agent. He's carrying out the will of Yaldabaoth, this uh, this inferior god. So at some point, a human allowed this demon to come in. Uh, yeah, he is he is possessed. He is possessed by this by this demon. That makes more sense. Okay, yeah, and. Why does he need why does he need to betray Jesus? Well, it's because Jesus is on the side of good. He's on the side of the supreme God. And so Yaldabaoth and the other demons are trying to stop the supreme God by stopping Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is that a retelling of the fight of the angels? The seraphim and the it, it, is, it, it reflects that battle. It, does, it is a reflection of that battle, that, that battle that is part of very late Old Testament theology. Okay, very late Old Testament theology. But Jesus could drive out demons. Yeah, but it, it looks like in the Gospel of, of Judas, he either can't because it's in the stars. Okay. It's written in the stars, it, it, and that's probably what it is. And that's, that's that's probably a reflection of the, uh, uh, you know. So, so does do the do these the um, Judas Christians do? But they believe that Jesus is the equal of the supreme God. No. Jesus is at best an emanation or an aeon of the Supreme God, and therefore inferior. I mean, they are, in one sense, they're very strict in their monotheism in the, in the, in the sense that there's only one Supreme God, but they're polytheists in the sense that this one God has many emanations. These A-E-O-N aeons are emanations from the Supreme God. So, you know, there, there are many people at this time who believe that, that inferior gods emanate. The, just to pull this into the, 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 the debate over proto-orthodoxy, 
the Nicene Creed does not say that the Son emanated from the Father, right? If you said that, you're not, you're not a Nicene Christian. The Son is, be, is uh, begotten of the Father. They consciously chose a different word, uh, both because they did not want to say that Jesus emanated from the Father, and they did not want to say that Jesus was created by the Father, which was the position of the Arians. So they used the word begotten to say this is an utterly unique act that happened in eternity. To say that Jesus is absolutely God's, the Son is absolutely God's ontological equal. He is God. The Gospel of Judas would not say that. All right, so, all right, um, let me finish up here. So, uh, about, the comic tells us that about 10 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, some evidence discovered that backs up her claim that Judas is not a friend of Jesus, but a demon. So there was this, uh, this uh, Paris gem discovered. And um, <clears throat> on it, uh, this, this gem is made of green jasper. It dates from the first or the second century from uh, an Egyptian workshop. And on the front of the gem is the figure of a lion. And on the back is inscribed the name Judas. So... Um, among the Gnostics, the most frequent image on uh, these gems was the image of a lion. And what did the lion stand for? The lion stand for the inferior deity, Yaldabaoth. So by having <clears throat> the image of the lion on one side and the name Judas on the other side, what does that gem indicate? that Judas is an accomplice or an agent of Yaldabaoth and therefore is evil and not the friend of Jesus as National Geographic said and as some of these other authors said. How about that there? So, <laughs> it's, I know it's, it's very complicated. It's very complicated, but I guess, I guess, you know, what I would say is this. What these Gospels do is open a window for us that indicate, more than anything else, I think, just how all over the place early Christianity really was. That there was never one, just one way of being Christian. There were several ways of, and, and all of them considered themselves Christian. If you were a Sethian, you were a Christian. If you were from the Thomas community, you, uh, you know, you considered yourself a Christian. Not much has changed. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. still, there's, there's many, many different ways of being a Christian, right? There might be more now than there were then. And we don't know which one of them is the true way. We don't know. It, and and so, so that's my second point. What's the, what, this, what this calls attention to is the necessity of A, faith, because we don't know, that's why we have to have faith, and B, being humble about our faith. Because whatever we believe, I hate to say it, we might be wrong. But we believe it. We believe it. And not only do we, do we believe it, but we stake our whole life on it. <laughs> You know, we live our whole life based on that belief. And so that's why I'm so happy that you all are here because you have an open enough mind to be able to, to look at, you know, just how many beliefs there are to choose from. <laughs> and we don't know which one is the right one. But we believe. We believe, you know, in, in, the, in the church that we, that we are part of. It's still not condemnation, though. It's still not condemnation. Of the other kinds? No. That I can't, I may believe this and I may be wrong. 
Yeah. But that still doesn't mean I can't get to heaven sort of thing. Uh, oh, a a absolutely. And it, all the rest of them too. Exactly. That's that's the humility part of it. Yeah. Is that yeah. You know, that that's that's where the humility comes in. It's not like my way is right yeah. and and everybody else is wrong. Well that's true, but that's still yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, now it's five after eleven. But, but thank you all for coming up. I hope this was helpful. Yeah,